This is day one of the 2008 Idaho Wild Bible School. Our second period teacher is Brother Anthony Whitehorn. His general topic is a life worth living. Today's topic is our situation. Brother Anthony. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. I, I just love that. When I came to Palm Springs, and, and that was the first time that's ever happened to me, whereby I said good morning, and the whole audience came back and said good morning, it took me aback. And then when I went back to the UK, and I said good morning, everybody, silence. I was like <laughs> tapping the mic, thinking they haven't heard what I'm saying. So it's lovely. So thank you very much indeed. Um, as you've already realised, I'm going to be speaking in English today. So I just hope that you're going to be following me and a few subtitles will come up. So things like when I say pavement, that's sidewalk, and uh, rubbish, is, uh, that's garbage, and cinema is movie, and trousers, that's pants. Now, <laughs> pants for us is something completely different, okay? So let's not get that too confused. So it's going to be in English all the way through today. So I hope you're going to be following me. If you don't follow me, please come and let me know. What is interesting, when I was at, uh, at Palm Springs, there was a brother who came up to me and he said, well, thank you so much, Brother Anthony, I really enjoyed, um, I really enjoyed your talk today. But uh, tell me, what is God's wrath? And I said, well, I started to explain it to him. It was a little concerning because the whole of my talk was about God's wrath. And he, and he just thanked me for being great and all the rest of it. And then he said, what is God's wrath? And I said, oh, he said, you mean God's wrath? That's what I mean. So if there's something you don't understand, just come and let me know, please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm going to start off with a story. There was, there was a man who came out of a factory and he was carrying a suitcase. And the security guard stopped him. And he said, can you open the, the suitcase? So he unzipped the suitcase and the security guard looked in there. There's nothing in there. So he shut it up and he went off again. And the next day, that self-same man came out of the factory carrying a suitcase. Security guard stopped him again and said, uh, what's in the suitcase? There was nothing in the suitcase. So he opened it up and had a look in there. And there was. There was nothing in the suitcase. So he let him go on again. The third day, this self-same guy came out of the factory and he stopped him and he said, what's in the suitcase? There's nothing in the suitcase. So he opened up the suitcase, he undid all the zips, he looked in there and there was nothing in the suitcase. So he zipped it all up again and he said to the guy, Tell me, what, I'm not going to nick you, I'm not going to do you here, but tell me, what are you doing here? And the guy turned to the security guard and he said, I'm stealing suitcases. <laughs> and that's the issue, you know. So often, we, and I'm part of this, we look at the detail. We get stuck right into the detail and we miss the big picture. And it was brought home to me about three or four months ago when somebody said to me, tell me, what's the Bible all about? Oh, and you think, I, I'm, hey, how long have you, you need to sit down here and I'm going to give her the whole thing? And he said, no, no, just in a couple of words. In a couple of words. And that really made me think a lot about a number of books, and in particular the Bible, because what I ended up doing is I thought to myself, actually, to sum up the Bible in two words. And I thought about it, and I thought like this, well, it's, it's about relationships. It's about God's relationships. That's a summary of the Bible. It's a little bit like there was God, and he chose, he chose to have a relationship with a person, obviously Adam, who let him down. And therefore he looked around and eventually he chose to have a relationship with Noah. And it's interesting, isn't it, that Noah is one of the few people in the scriptures who is identified as being blameless and righteous. You've got Job who is characterised as being blameless, you've got Paul who said he was blameless, but Noah was blameless and righteous. But of course, Noah died. And then God wanted a relationship with not just a person, but a whole family. So he chose Abraham and Abraham's children, of course. And the whole of the Old Testament is about God's relationship with that family. But of course, they also let him down. 
And so now God says, I want to have a relationship with those who want to have a relationship with me. And that was really quite interesting for me, to go through that exercise and try and have the, the big picture, the helicopter approach. Because so often I'm in the detail. And I, I've tried to do that with a number of books in the Bible. For instance, the book of Judges. How well do we know about Samson and how well do we know about Gideon and Ehud? We know about all those, but what's the big picture? I put it to you, it's the sin salvation cycle. That's the big picture of the book of Judges. And I did the self-same thing with another book. It's this one here. It's the first letter of Peter. I happened to be reading it at the time and I thought, what is the helicopter approach? The first letter of Peter. Now, I realised that I knew parts of Peter. I knew that, that little section about um, flesh is grass and I knew that section about... Um, obeying authorities in 1 Peter 2 and I knew that section about uh, Jesus judging the living and the dead and the section about wives and husbands but what's the big picture? Well when you actually get into the structure of the first epistle of Peter it's really quite interesting because in doing that we get the helicopter approach in chapter 1 in fact in verse 1 we see the recognition of our situation verse 3 to 12 we realise the appreciation of his grace and salvation. And then in verse 13 of chapter 1 through until verse 12 of chapter 2, our response, and our response is to be separate, to be sanctified, to be holy. And then almost the rest of, the script, of, of that letter is our responsibility. And Peter goes through and talks to those people who have appreciated, first of all, their situation, God's grace and therefore their responsibilities because of their response this is their responsibilities and he, he actually lists some responsibilities that they should do and then there's a summary and conclusion and really when you analyse that and you think about it that's what I want to be thinking about over the next few days because the big picture the helicopter approach, the first epistle of Peter, is actually one of hope. Because he takes our situation and he analyses it, and he realises that actually it's hopeless. And therefore he says, you have been given the gift of grace, and because of that gift of grace, you are in a different situation, a different paradigm. And because of that, you need to make a response and you therefore have some responsibilities. And actually, that's what we're going to be doing. This week we're going to be looking at, first of all, our situation, just as Peter looked at in verse 1. And then what is our status now? And then thirdly, what is our response to that? And fourthly, our responsibilities and we'll be taking two elements of that two settings on that one and then the last one is almost a conclusion of all of all of what we've been considering there now I tell you now this is quite tricky it's quite tricky to listen to I'm really so, it's not a good way to start this is it it's going to be very tricky for you to listen to because usually when you you perhaps do a character you can follow it through you can, yeah, when he was at this stage and then he grew up and then he did that and it's very easy to follow through. Or you do a book and you start at the beginning of the book and you walk through the book and you can follow it. We're not going to be doing that. We're going to be doing a process. Now, following a process is quite difficult. I'm sorry, but actually I found it for myself really challenging. So if you get nothing out of it, okay, but I got a lot out of this. Um, we're going to look at our situation and then we're going to look at our status, our response, our responsibilities because of that. And hopefully you're going to be with me for some of the time. If you'll go off to the teenage class, I know that you just weren't with me whatsoever, so that's all right, I understand that as well. So, let's just start off then. And I'd like to start off by telling you a story. Um, when we go on holiday, my family and I, 
in the evenings, we play cards. Now, um, it's quite interesting because uh, times have changed. I used to love playing cards with my family when my children were really small. Because I always won, and it was great. <laughs> now they've got a little bigger, it's not so much fun. And actually, what happened um, uh, on the last holiday, and I remember it distinctly, my daughter, who's the youngest of, of, of our family, we'd been playing cards for about two nights, two or three nights, and we came to the conclusion of the game, and she won. I tell you that because, not just because it was unusual for her to win, um, but also because of her response. She was overjoyed that she'd won. She'd beaten her brother, she'd beaten me. She thought it was fantastic. And at the end of that, it, it sort of lasted for about, I don't know, 15 seconds, because then we just got all the cards and we put them back in the box. And it was, it was like her whole demeanour changed. The game had finished. The cards had gone back in the box. And that was quite fascinating in itself because it made me realise that actually that's our situation. That's exactly what happens to us. The cards go back in the box. Solomon, the second wisest person to have ever lived, he, he realised that. He had everything. He had wealth, friends, power. And he said, actually, everything is vanity. Vanity, vanity. It's completely meaningless, this life. And it's really quite depressing when you think of it like that. But everything in life is completely meaningless. And in fact, and I, I don't know whether it's the same in the States, um, or in Canada, or in New Zealand, but it's true in the UK. The most common ailment that somebody goes to the doctor about is not a coronary, it's not cancer, it's depression. There are more people who go to the doctor in the UK about depression than any other ailment. We have approximately 65 million people in the UK and over 6 million people each year, almost 10% of the population, go to the doctor with depression. And what is also true is we are not completely immune from that as individuals. I know in our meeting, for instance, that there are people who suffer from depression. I can think of three people who are actually on antidepressants in our meeting. It's a, a malaise, it's an ailment that we have. And I would like you, therefore, to just take a, a, a look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And thinking about that, that ailment that we have, um, when Brother Murray was just talking just now, I, I realised that that's what he was talking about with that idea of being um, paralysed and in pain. That is our human condition. Our human condition is the cards go back in the box. And that's what Ecclesiastes says. And it's one of those little verses that you read and you completely, you just pass over. But somebody pointed it out to me. And it's a beautiful little verse, this. It's Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and it's verse 10. And I've underlined in my Bible, verse 10 and 11. I have seen the burden God has laid on men. I'm reading from the International Version. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Look at that. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. That's us. You know, we are never, ever, ever going to be satisfied in this life. Why? Because we're not built for this life. That's what it says. It says there. He has set eternity in us. And so therefore, 
We're not going to be satisfied by fame, by wealth, by self-fulfilment, by self-actualization. Why? Because we are not built for this world. I just want you to imagine that you're inventors. And you have just invented the fastest train in the world. It's taken you years and years, but you as inventors have just invented the fastest train in the world. It goes 400 miles an hour and it's an amazing thing. And you go and present it to the railway authorities and they say, that's an amazing thing that you have just invented. And they say, I tell you what, we'd really like you to run it on our railways. You think, this is fantastic. What we'd like to do is we'd like you to run it from North LA to South LA. No, hang on a minute. I just invented the fastest train in the world and, and you just want me to run it from North LA to South LA? That's not fulfilling the purpose for which it was made. And that's a little bit like ourselves. You see, why did God make you and me? Of course, it says in Genesis, we are made... Let us make man in our image. We're completely different from any other animal, obviously. We're not, a, we're not a set of reflex actions. We have conscience, we have love, we have empathy. Why? Because God made us so we can have a relationship with him. We are the only ones who can have a relationship with God. And that's what this is all about. And what God has done is he has said, I want to have a relationship with you. But, I want to have a relationship with you forever. That's why I made you. That's why I built you the way that I have. Think to yourself, why do you want to be in the kingdom? Somebody asked me that and I said, well, I want to live with Jesus forever. That's fine. I put it to you that actually that's that's possibly not the answer. Perhaps we should be saying to ourselves, why do I want to be in the kingdom? I want to be in the kingdom because I want to fulfill the purpose for which I was made. And that is having a relationship with God forever. And we have the template in the Lord Jesus Christ to enable us to try and, we will, we will fail, but to try and live up to that. We have nine months whereby we prepare ourselves for this world. We have 70 years where we are preparing ourselves for eternity. There was um, uh, a man who'd been out on missionary work and he was returning after 20 years on missionary work and he's returning on the ship. And as he came in on the ship, the president of the US was on the same ship as him. And as they pulled into harbour, so the fanfare started and the red carpet came out and the president of the United States had just been on a little holiday he got off the boat and he walked down to full of acclaim, lots of clapping, as he walked down the red carpet. And the man who had been on missionary work for the last 20 years, he just got off from a side door and walked away. And he was really sad and depressed. And he said to God, God, why, why aren't they welcoming me home? And God turned to him and said, the thing is, is you're not home yet. And that's you and me. We are not built for this world. And that is our situation. This is only a temporary assignment. This is almost like a waiting room. Imagine, imagine that you've gone to a motel and when you go to a motel, as you check in, you, 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 you take all your stuff out 
and you then get you then get the paint and you start painting the walls you start decorating the whole thing you, I was about to say you knit some you don't knit curtains do you? no you don't you sew curtains oh, I'm useless you sew curtains and you put them up you don't do that do you? You don't do that in your motel room. Why don't you do that? You don't do that because you're not there long enough and it's not yours. Good attitude. The cards go back in the box. But it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to appreciate our situation. It's really hard. When Tolkien wrote Lord of the Rings, and Tolkien was a Christian... Um, the main theme of Lord of the Rings is Frodo's mission. And Frodo's mission, for those of you who have read the book, Frodo's mission was about destroying the ring. But throughout Lord of the Rings, there is Frodo's distraction. And Frodo's distraction was about seeking his own power and glory. Our mission... What is our mission? Our mission is to prepare ourselves for a time when we can have a relationship with God forever. That's our mission. Our distraction is seeking our own power and glory. And the thing is, is that when we fail to get that power and glory we get frustrated. And sometimes when we do get some of that power and glory, we don't feel fulfilled. Why? Because we're not built for this world. And that's the issue. Our situation is a temporary assignment. And that was what Peter was starting off by telling us. We're going to look now at just two passages. The first passage is uh, Luke. Luke chapter 12. Uh, Luke chapter 12, and we're going to be reading from um, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain man, a certain rich man, produced a good crop. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. Now, this was um, an individual who obviously uh, came to to Jesus and there was a rule at that that time uh, that an elder son received double a younger one's portion. We don't really know which, which one this person was necessarily. And there were many disputes over such matters where, where normally they were settled by the rabbi. And so that's why this this man came to Jesus to settle this dispute. And Jesus said, you're completely missing the point here. And there, he talks about in in that that, that lovely passage there, um, where he he really says, "For there's a lovely translation I've got here, he says, for even when a man has more than enough, this does not give him life. For even when a man has more than enough, this does not give him life. And in this passage here, 
what we see here is that in verse 16 he told in this parable it wasn't the man that produced a good crop it was the ground God God had given him a good crop it wasn't his at all it was the ground of a certain amount that produced a good crop but the problem was is that, that this this rich man then goes on and says what does he say? This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and there I will store all my grain and my goods and I'll say to my... He goes on nine times he talked about himself as if he had done it. This isn't about wealth per se. This is about the completely wrong focus. This is about looking at himself, at his greed. And this man here is Nabal. Nabal of the New Testament. That's what this man is. Think about Nabal of the Old Testament. And what does Nabal mean? It means fool. And he was. Why? Because Nabal said, Shall I take my bread and my water? It's not his at all. Why? Because in the end, the cars go back in the box. So, the two warnings is that first one from Luke 12, verse 13 to 21. But there's another warning, and that one comes in 1 Peter. 1 Peter, let's have a look at that one. 1 Peter, and uh, let's look at chapter 1. And this is where, where Peter identifies and realises our situation. And he says, at the very start, and just, just, just remember what Peter was previously, how he had changed, how he transformed from being the fisherman to a godly man. And he starts off right at the very beginning, and he says there in verse 1, to God's elect strangers in the world. He reckoned, I think some translation says aliens or exiles or foreigners. He recognises what we are. That's what we are. We are strangers and foreigners and exiles in this world. We are not built for this world. And then in verse 17 it says the same thing. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. That is our job. Just flick back to Hebrews 11. Keep your, 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 your finger in um, Peter. Uh, if you flick back to Hebrews chapter 11 and of course we have uh, in Hebrews 11 that I, I like to call it the hall of fame of faith and um, just have a look in verse 13 and what is the hallmark of those individuals it says there in verse 13 all these people were still living by faith when they died they did not receive the things promised they only saw them and welcomed them from a distance and they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth why, why, why were they there? why are they put in Hebrews 11? because they realised their situation Noah, I said a, Noah is a, is a really interesting example just think about, about Noah. Noah probably had never ever seen rain before. Pretty certain that he'd never seen a flood before and pretty certain he'd never seen a boat before. And God comes along and says, it's going to rain, you're going to have a flood and I want you to build a boat. I'd have said, can you just run it over me again? Not Noah. He gets on and does it. And I don't quite know how long it took. I try to look into this, and this is an interesting one. Somebody might like come and tell me later how long it took from the first time that God said to Noah, go and build a boat, to the time it flooded. I read one commentary, and they said it was over 100 years. I know that when Shem, Ham and Japheth um, went on the, the ark, they were 100 years old at that stage. What I do know is it says in, in 1 Peter, no need to look at it, but in 1 Peter 3 verse 20, 
it actually says that God patiently waited while Noah built the ark. So, so you, I sort of used to have this impression when I, I, I was younger, um, actually a couple of years ago even, so not so young, uh, actually that, that as soon as God said, go and build an ark, and in a couple of years the ark was built, and then it flooded. I don't, I don't think it was probably like that. Let's say it was 50 years. How do you think Noah felt after he built the ark? Let's say it took him six, seven years to build the ark. How do you think he felt in year 49? He must have been thinking, oh, I've done this. And all those people are coming. What have you done here? The sea's a long, long way away from here, Noah. And we're pretty high up. It's going to rain. There's going to be a flood. Right. But he realised that life was a temporary assignment, that he was a stranger and an alien, and that God was getting him ready for the kingdom. And likewise, Abraham. Abraham was well off. He had many possessions, and God said to him, I want you to leave this. The Earl of the Chaldees was a nice place. They had two-story houses. They even had a sewage system. And in those days, that was that was seriously advanced in civilization. And God said, I want you to leave this and I, I, I'm going to take you somewhere else. Did Abraham say, you need to just tell me a lot more about this God, map it out for me, tell me where we're going in a time schedule? No, he just, he just packed up. And he went to Haram and then finally on to Canaan. And then God, of course, promised him a son. And then he said, and now I want you to kill him. Sorry? I just want you to kill him. Life is a temporary assignment. I'm a stranger, I'm a sojourner. And God is getting me ready for the kingdom. And those men of faith are, are great examples to me not to get all entrenched and worried about today. That's not what this life is about. God is not interested in my status, in my popularity, in my wealth, in my achievements, in my reputation. He's not even interested in how I feel. He is only, only interested in preparing me for eternity. And that's what he's interested only in you as well. Because he's built you and me such that we can have a relationship with him forever. And this is just getting us ready for that. 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1. Let's have a look at uh, 1 Peter 1 and uh, ver uh, yeah, verse 6 to 7. So 1 Peter 1 and verse 6 to 7 says this. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. So when you go through those problems at work, those problems with your neighbours, those worries that you have, it says, in this you great rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, much better than all that wealth that we've accumulated, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible, inexpressible and glorious joy. We're being prepared, brethren and sisters. That's the purpose of this life. That is our situation. Just like the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, it is an 11-day journey from Egypt to the Promised Land. But when they came out of Egypt and they came to that first barrier of water, they turned to God, they turned to Moses and said, what have you done? If only we were back in, in Egypt. 
And Moses then, of course, parted the water and they, I love that, they walked through on dry ground. Isn't that lovely? But when God blesses, he, he really blesses. It wasn't like muddy ground, it was dry ground. But God realised that here was a nation that needed to be prepared for the promised land. And it took 40 years to do that. And when they came to another stretch of water, God said to them, and of course it was the River Jordan, which was springtime, and the waters would have been really high and flowing fast. And God said, what I want you to do is get the Levites, carry the Ark of Covenant on their shoulders and walk into the water. And they did. And the moment that the water touched the ankles of the Levites, so God stopped the water up at Adam and they walked through on dry ground. This was a different people. Not just physically, but spiritually as well. But it took 40 years to prepare this people. And when you think about the children of Israel, I don't know how many of you have ever been to, to Israel. Um, Sally and I and the children, uh, a couple of years ago, we, we walked up Mount Sinai. And um, you might think that, that parts of, of Palm Springs, or not even the Palm Springs, but out there, the desert looks, looks bad. You want to go to Sinai. That is desolate. We walked up at night because you can't walk in the day. It is so hot. So we walked up at night up Mount Sinai to watch the sunrise. And when we were walking, we looked at, uh, at the countryside. It was desolate. We had loads of water with us and we were walking at night. I tell you what, how was it for the children of Israel? It would have been searing heat for them. I believe that the cloud that looked after them by day was covering them absolutely. And that protected them. But the countryside was desolate. Where were they going? No wonder they complained to God. I would have done. But God was making them realise that this is a temporary assignment. He is moulding us, getting us ready, preparing you and me for the promised land. And so finally, this final passage. You see, in our situation today, we know from Romans 8, we know that in all things God works for good for those who love him. How well do we know that passage? But we know, we are absolutely sure, it is a certainty, writes Paul. This is, this is not perhaps, this is, this is a certainty. That in all things, not in some things, but in all things. That's 24-7. God is so interested in our salvation, that in all things. The moment that we get up in the morning and we're walking here, God is interested in us. But I remember looking at um, uh, a video, a video, that takes me back, a DVD then, a DVD of uh, our Sunday school party. And it was showing all, all, everything that was going on. And then there was this shot of a row of parents. And all these parents were staring at something. And the camera then panned and you saw they were staring at their children. And all their children were doing, they weren't doing anything fantastic, they were just playing. And that's how God is. He is so interested in our lives that in all things, even when we're just playing, 
He's there, watching us. Why? Because God works. He is powerful and effective and dynamic in our lives today. And why? He does it for good. Now, that doesn't mean at all, if you've been following me for the last 45 minutes, that it means that we're going to be popular and wealthy and powerful. He is not interested in that one bit. He is working for good. That means he is working for our salvation, for us to be with him forever, to have a relationship with him. That's why. So we know, we are certain, that in absolutely everything, even when we're playing, God works for good for our salvation, for being there for you and me. Why? Because we love him. So what does that mean then? It means that all of our problems, all of our worries, all of our concerns, God is in control of them. He knows all about them. He's present with them. Some of them may well have been induced by him, but he knows about them and they are there for the good but they're temporary and they have a purpose so what is the conclusion as Solomon would say what do we have then here in the conclusion of the matter the conclusion of the matter for our situation is this brethren and sisters this life is temporary and so often So often I forget that. I'm so worried about, you know, what I'm doing at work or what's going on with my family that I forget. But eventually the cards go back in the box. And also this it has a purpose. And what's that purpose? That purpose, and it might be. 70, 80, 90, 30, 40 years. I don't know. Only God knows how long you have on this earth as a temporary assignment to fulfil a purpose. And that purpose is solely to prepare you and me for the time when we will live with God forever and forever have that relationship with him because that is the purpose for which we were made and you know what ours is therefore the only life worth living Amen